right now. Good morning, Washed by the Word Santa Fe. Good morning, Facebook. I'm going to hop on live on my phone here. As you guys know, I was uh, kicked out of going live on my regular status for posting a little bit of truth. Not a big deal. I just had to make a new <laughs> channel so that I could uh, go live. But if you guys want to turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 8. Let me get over here in this live feed with my uh, phone and share it to my page. Let's see. Do a watch party. Start watch party. There we go. All right. Now, babe, will you go ahead and check and make sure that the sound is good? And if everything's well, then we are good to go. All right. All right. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for being our God, and we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you that you are who you are. That there is none like you, Lord, that you give a love that's abundant, abundant in mercy, abundant in kindness, abundant even in judgment, God. In your judgment, we find joy in you. We thank you, Lord, that you are who you are, all-encompassing, that nothing escapes your notice, nothing escapes your hand, Lord. We thank you that you can give precision accuracy with prophecy. We thank you that you can tell us what is to come and what to expect so that when it comes, Lord, we're not dismayed and we're not left in awe and, and in shock, but that we're left more in joy that you are in control. We thank you, Lord, that you are you. As we get into your word this morning, Lord, would you penetrate our hearts? Would you remove me from myself, Lord, and would your Holy Spirit fill me? Would you be the teacher here this morning? We love you, Lord, and most of all, we thank you for loving us, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Now, a quick update. As you guys know, we did that little uh, outreach yesterday for Santa Fe. We went, we just gave food to the homeless, loved on them, ministered to anybody who was willing to be ministered to. Um, it was excellent. It was awesome, you guys. Um, anybody who's live, it's not a church-based deal. When I say that, what I mean is it's not our church or your church. It's the body of Christ being the church coming together. And so future you know, reference, if you ever want to join, get on anybody watching live, message me. We'll give you our information. We can hook up. We plan on doing it again in about a month, so somewhere in July, mid-July. We would love for you to join us. That being said, it was, it was excellent, and we, you know, we saw some awesome fruit. And then we look forward to seeing whatever fruit comes forward from the planting of those seeds and the watering of those seeds that we've been doing. Anyways, let's get into the book of Daniel. So there was a man. He was an atheist, you know. Like a lot of atheists are, he was smart, he was educated, he was educated in the arts and educated in, in, in the books, and he's just a smart man. But he had a beef, he had a beef with God, he's angry at God, just angry atheist, a oh, bitter atheist, and we met those. And one night in a drunken stupor, he's cursing God and accusing God of just being a horrible God. God, you know, if you, if I was God, the whole bit, the whole nine yards, you know, we've all met somebody like that. And he just accuses God of messing up his life. And if he was God, he would have done a better job. And so God zaps him off and the guy appears into nothingness and God's before him. And God looks at him and says, so I hear you have a complaint against me. And the guy says, yeah, he's still in his drunken stupor. If I were God, if I were you, I would, I would have done it right. There would be no evil. He just goes off on his little tangent like he knows what he's talking about. The guy says, okay, you're a marksman. You're a marksman. I made you. I created you. I gave you the ability to shoot. So him being a marksman, an atheist, a, a, an educated man, let me get just backdrop on this atheist. He could hit a, a target from four miles out, okay? So he's an excellent marksman. And God tells him, okay, you're a marksman. You're smart. You're a wise man. You should be able to calculate how to hit a target from a good distance. Ah, I could do it better than you. And God says, I accept the challenge. And God hands him a rifle and says, I placed a target on earth. And might I add you, this nothingness where they are is the edge of the universe. They're just out in the middle of nowhere, deep space. And God's got them there. And God says, go ahead and point the gun and shoot. And if you hit the target, or if you could even get closer than I get, I'll hand it all over to you. It's yours. And the guy looks at God like, well, uh, I can't see you. Like, there's nothing. Like, where am I supposed to shoot? And God just says, well, can you not, are you saying you can't do it? And the guy with pride cocks that gun and points in the middle of nothingness and <laughs> proud, hands his gun, the gun to God and God pulls a bullet out of his pocket and flicks it. <laughs> you know, it sounds like, a, you know, the sound, the, the, when the sound barrier breaks and God grabs him by the arm and zaps him back to earth and they're standing next to a target. 
the guy's like, what are we doing here? And you hear just this out of hitting the atmosphere. And this little ball of fire comes and smacks the target dead center, leaving a hole in it. And the guy says, do you now understand? And the guy looks at him and says, well, how do we know that wasn't my bullet? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and, and moral of the story, what God does, he does with great accuracy. Great accuracy. From across the universe, God can flick a bullet and hit the target dead center. Yeah. Even so, the historian, the atheist, the doubter, the one who's the liberal-minded, we don't need God and God's a barbaric idea, they, they see prophetic utterance and they, they call it a lie. They'll go as far as to say God is a cheat. There is no way the Bible record, and I say that for a good purpose today, because today we're going to, I told you last week, we're going to start zooming in on these empires we've been looking into. We've been looking at Babylon. We've looked at them as the golden image, as the silver arms, as the bronze, you know, a, a torso, as the iron legs and the feet made of iron and clay. And then we went to see as God shows the vision from his standpoint, we saw them as beasts, we saw this lion with wings, and we saw this bear with the ribs, and we saw this leopard with the four heads and the four wings, and we saw this great beast with iron teeth and you know, crushing everything in its path. And we've talked about how that's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then, of course, you know, the rock, I should obviously mention that, but you know, we're focusing on world history as the Gentiles go, so to speak. And then the rock being Christ. And then we saw the kingdom last week. And today we're going to, I told you last week, we would start zooming in. Today we're going to take that lens and zoom in a little bit on the Medo-Persian Empire and on the Grecian Empire. More specifically, the Greeks. And somebody's going to come out of the Greeks and he's going to be a very interesting fellow. And he's going to do some very wicked things to the Jews. And this, this was fulfilled in about the, you know, second century BC. And... He's a man that goes by the name of Antiochus IV, or most of us know him as Antiochus Epiphanes. And he was a very wicked man who was a foreshadowing, a prefiguring of this wicked man, the son of perdition who is to come. This, this man of lawlessness that the Bible calls him. But we're going to see these today, and many of the liberal theologians will look at this, and they'll say, God could not have predicted. There's no way. Somebody must have wrote this after the fact. There's no way that this could have been written before its time. It's impossible. And as we zoom in today, we're going to see with great accuracy, God declares, as we call it, the beginning from the end. God declares what's going to take place. And he does it in such a way. And as we continue to go forward next week, we're going to zoom in even further, go get even closer on the microscopic scale on what's going to take place in human history. At least for us, it's history. For them, it's future. But let's get on in. In chapter 8, verse 1, it says, In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar. Now, we remember who Belshazzar is. He's the last Babylonian King, this with him, the empire of Babylon ends. We remember that the Greeks, I mean the Greeks, the Medo Persians, they came in through the, the river, they, they blocked it off, and they came and they conquered, they killed him, and while he was in his drunken stupor, so to speak. And that was the end of it. So if we're past that already, again, why are we referring to this past king? Why are we going back to his third year for the same reason as last year? Daniel's springboarding backwards. So he's already writing all he's writing all this at a later time in his life and he's springboarding backwards saying this is the date this is the time this is the place this is where I was when this particular vision came to me we talked about that a little bit last year so I don't think it's necessary to go too deep into it but it says in his third year of the reign of Belshazzar king the king a vision appeared to me Daniel subsequent to the one which appeared to me pre previously right in order he says I looked in the vision and while I was looking I was in the citadel of Susa which is in the province of Elam now lots of good commentators lots of good opinions and I, I've heard both of them many people say that this 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 place where he's at at the citadel in Susa they say well he's having his vision there you know, he's, he's actually in Babylon, but he's envisioning himself in the citadel at Susa. And, you know, and all this fancy stuff's going to take place. And others say, no, no, he was out and about on the king's business. And as he was out and about, he was in the province of Elam in Susa, which was a actually prominent place. This is in the area where Cyrus will eventually set up his center 
and he was on the king's about the king's business doing the work that Daniel did and truthfully I'm gonna be straight with you it really doesn't matter whether he, he's visioning himself in Susa or whether he's actually in Susa it's irrelevant to the vision that's about to take place I believe why Daniel's mentioning this I, I believe he's actually there and you'll see why as we go forward in the text but I believe he's actually there and it's nothing more than a status of a uh, of I wrote it down let's see here um of authentication so you know like let's say something happens at all subs I've been going to all subs while I'm up here because you know those stupid chimichangas and burritos are so good you know? <laughs> I don't care who you are. If you've never had an all sub chimichanga, you get off your butt today and go get one. They're so good. But, you know, <laughs> you get lots of sauce <laughs> and the burrito. But, you know, if, if, let's say something happened at all subs and oh, I saw somebody rob the, the, guy, the clerk and he runs out with a bag of money and looks like a cartoon character and it's this whole issue. If I came back to here to, this, to the little fellowship, it's like, guys, you'd never guess what just happened. Some guy robbed him. The first thing I would say, though, is, I was at all subs because when we give a description or we, we talk about where we're at at the moment, it gives an authentication to it. Like I could be like, oh, I was at this place and so and so. You might not have no idea what that place is, but the fact that I'm establishing that place is, is stating that, hey, there's a date, a time, a place, a geographical location. And that's all he's doing, I believe. He's just giving a geographical location that authenticates the fact that he was actually there. Now, if you don't believe that, I really don't care. You don't have to believe that. And we'll see why I take that stance as we move forward in the text. But I believe he was about the king's business down in Susa. And this is where he has the visions. Daniel being the faithful servant that he is and God just blessing him. But it's not a salvation issue. So it doesn't really matter. But it's just good for your own context. But he says he was in Susa, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision and I myself was beside Uli, the Ulai Canal. Then I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue him from his power, but he did as he pleased and magnified himself. Now this ram, as we zoom in onto this ram, we've seen this ram first as the shoulders of, of, of silver. We've seen this ram as the bear leaning on one side with his ribs, and now we're seeing him as the ram. And the interesting thing about this ram is the Persians were known for having a ram as their symbol. They would march into battle with banners with a ram on it. Their shields would have a picture of a ram on it. And so not only is God giving him the detail of who this is, but he's giving it with great accuracy because what, what just was just mentioned, you know, if, if you're Daniel looking at this, this makes no sense. But in the future, looking back at history, we see this and we're like, this is exactly what Medo-Persia did. Historically, them being a symbol of a ram, these two horns that came up, we know that the Medes were the dominant power at first. And as the Medes kind of weakened out, the Persians took over and it eventually just becomes Persia but it's still mentioned as Medo-Persia. So when he talks about that horn coming up, that represents the Medes. And he says, after a larger horn came up, a stronger horn, we've seen in the past studies that the horn is symbolic for strength, which, fair, you know, if you got were to see, we talked about this last week, if you saw two bucks about to fight and one had two little stubs sticking out and the other had a 16-point rack, you know, who do you think is going to win that battle? The 16-point rack is going to decimate that little stubbed, <laughs> you know, dear, point being said. And so this larger horn that comes out is Cyrus, represents Cyrus, this represents the Medes. And the sweet thing about this, especially with Daniel, is as we go forward, we're going to see that the interpretation is given to us. So there is zero, zero argument about who this is. I mean, historically, we know it's the Persians. It fits them perfectly. But if we were to jump down to verse 20, just real quickly, the angel Gabriel talking says this to Daniel. And the meaning of the, let's see, where are we at? Oh, wrong chapter, my bad. In chapter 8, verse 20, the ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. That's the end of discussion. That's, this is who that is. But again, looking back from history, we look at this and with accuracy, this is what happened. As Mira and the Persian, they, they grouped together, they came in, they conquered the Babylonians, and they, they're enjoying their reign right now. They've conquered all the known lands. 
Cyrus under the Persians becomes stronger and greater. And he's the horn that comes up afterwards. Now it says of this ram that he was budding uh, westward, northward, southward. And no beast could stand before him. Again, this is a perfect depiction of what media, the Medio Persian Empire, of what they did. Because when they came, they went west, they went north, and they went south. Notice it doesn't mention east. And actually, it talks about this in Isaiah 41, uh, chapter 2. It talks about this kingdom coming from the east. And when we see the Medo Persian Empire, we see them as coming from the east. So they're not conquering the east, they're from the east, and they're coming and they're conquering everything else. We see from the, from the west, they conquered Babylon, Mesopotamia, Syria, Asia Minor, North Colchis, Armenia, Liberia, and the regions around the Caspian Sea. And then they went down south and they conquered Palestine, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Libya. And we see this is exactly what Persia did. They came in, they just swooped in, and, and they overpowered people with numbers. They had power too, by all means, but they were known for their numbers. Again, I talked about last week, if you've ever seen the, the movie 300, uh, there's some graphic scenes in there. You know, I don't necessarily encourage people to watch it, but I like movies like that, and it's a, a crazy movie. I like the war aspect, obviously. But when they represent the Persians, they did a, a fairly good job because when the Persians, when the Medo-Persians came, they came with good luck basically you know you might be the baddest fighter in the world but at some point you tire out and you just get overpowered by numbers that was the medo persian empire and they just took over most of what is known as the known world of that time and so it says here that they butted westward northward southward and no other beast could stand before him nor was there anyone to rescue from his power but he did as he pleased and magnified himself like every other kingdom you know, they're raised up in pride, they magnify themselves. Which, you know, I've found when a person magnifies themselves, when a nation magnifies itself, that's typically the start of their downfall. And we're going to see here that Persia, they, they reigned for, for a good number of years. As a matter of fact, what we're about to see next is the Grecian Empire rise. You know, and as we read prophecy, or the Macedonian Grecian Empire, as, but it's known as just the Greek Empire, it's what it is. But if we want to get real literal. But... About 100 years prior to the Greeks, Alexander the Great coming up and being prominent, about 100 years prior, the Medo-Persians conquered Macedon, his land. They con again, they conquered all that known area of the known world. And that's part of a little beef that Alexander the Great is going to have with the Persians. And that's part of his little kickstart to her. And going, he's going to conquer the Persians, and we're about to see that. But we see that they magnified themselves. And again, humans being magnified only last so long. That's why we magnify the Christ. He's risen from the dead. There's, there's no decaying for him. There is no demoting for him. He's the all in all. And so when you get the inclination to want to magnify yourself and think that you're something oh so great and what would God do without me, realize that's really the start of your downfall. <laughs> you know? And God will be faithful just like he did with the Babylon, Babylonians, with the Medo-Persians, with the Greeks, with every empire that's ever risen, with every human that's ever risen. He's faithful to humble you and bring you to nothing. And he does that. In verse 5, it says, While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. Now, this male goat represents the kingdom of Greece. How do we know? Let's flip back over to the end of chapter 8 to verse 21. It says, The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. That's how we know. The Bible t tells us. And as we've said in past times, the Bible is the standard. The Bible is all in all. When the Bible says it, that's the end of discussion. It's Greece. And again, we know it's Greece, especially as we look at the detail that it goes into. There's nobody else that it could be except Greece, specifically under Alexander the Great. And again, when we get to chapter 10 and 11, it goes even deeper into the facts. It goes even deeper into, into the details of what is going to take place for them, what has taken place from us looking backwards. But it says that while they, he was observing, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole ground, uh, earth without touching the ground. Now, do you remember how the Grecian Empire was, was uh, visualized by Daniel last week? He was the leopard, right? He was the leopard with the four heads and the four wings. And we talked about those wings representing the swiftness, the quickness of how that nation moved. We saw it in Babylon, how Babylon, how they won, they were swift and quick. And that's, that was the real, you know, attribute to their victories. And they, they ended up getting some power and some help, but it was their swiftness. Alexander the Great, that's what made his 
army, that's what made his empire so powerful, is they were swift, they were quick. And within 12 years, Alexander the Great conquers the entire, that's unheard of, the entire known world, took out the powerhouse of the, and he did it. They'd get in and out. And his army was nothing great. It truly was nothing great. It was actually a small army. I mean, especially compared to the Persians. But he was swift. He was swift. And more importantly, God said he would do this. And ultimately, it's God who gave him the ability to do this very thing because, well, God is sovereign and God, everything that happens, it passes through his hands. But he moves swiftly, swiftly denoting his rapid conquest. Now, interesting facts about Alexander the Great because he really is an interesting character in history. You know, when he was young, he wasn't like your average young man. You know, <clears throat> when I was a kid, we used to have like dirt cloud fights. And dirt cloud fights would turn into rock fights. You know, and boys, was it smart? No. Did we do it? Yeah, we did. When we were kids, we used to lay six or seven kids on the ground and put a ramp in front of them and then ramp to the six or seven kids. And if you got hit, then, you know, it happened. You know? And, and, you know, everybody had to take their turn at the end. Everybody got their turn at the end of the, the laying down. And was it smart? Nah. Did we do it? Yeah. You know, as a kid, there used to be this like, this, like 45 foot hill, 50 foot hill, and it was a dirt hill. And we decided to put somebody on the seat and somebody standing up and somebody on the handlebars and let's ride down the hill. Was it smart? Nah. Did we do it? Yeah. Because we're boys. That's what boys do. That wasn't Alexander the Great. While the kids were off playing war with their swords and with their, you know, play bow and arrows and having fun, Alexander the Great was a reader. He was a little bookworm. He was more interested in the arts. He was more interested in, in education. He wasn't, and because of that, his dad thought he would amount to nothing. In that day, a warrior was everything, though. In that day, I mean, to be a warrior, that's where the glory was. To go into battle and glory and fight for your king, and to, that was where the glory was. You know, there was no glory in shining shoes or sandals or being a sh shoemaker, tent maker, any of that making little, I, there was no glory in any of that. There was glory in going and winning battles or dying for your king. And that wasn't going to be, so he has nothing. But, dude still loves his son, and so he sends him off to be tutored. And he, he's tutored by a, a unique person in history. Most of us at least are aware of his name. His name is Aristotle, the philosopher. And this is the guy who tutored Alexander the Great from age 12 to 19. Somewhere around there, you know, give or take some numbers, but definitely around 19 because that's when his papa dies. And so at 19, his dad dies and something stirs up inside Alexander and he just becomes a leader. There's something in him that just, you know, it's like when somebody just rises to the occasion, that was him. And rather than using just brute force and power, well, he was a smart dude. He studied under the greatest philosopher of the day. He understood. And so he conquered more with his brain than he did with you know, power and might and numbers. And because of the way he did it, again, he started his conquest at around age 21, and by 33, it's when he died, the whole known world was in his power. That is an incredible feat. And, you know, because his arrogance, he calls himself Alexander the Great. <laughs> and that's how he went down in history, because what he did truly was an incredible feat. But that's this man here that's leading this army. This is this goat. Now, it's interesting that he's called a goat. Uh, I, I didn't look into it, but I was real curious to see the significance between a ram and a goat. Now, interesting. I'd imagine the ram to be bigger, stronger, and the goat to not be quite as such. But I didn't actually look into the differences, so I don't want to give you false details. I just wanted to put, see a comparison in there and, you know, didn't do that, so I'm not going to go there. So maybe if you're watching online or something, you want to go off into a and look into that. Yeah, that might be fun. But I ended up super busy and had to pick and choose <laughs> what I was going to teach. And that's where I am. But this Alexander the Great, interesting that they're called the goat. I was trying to find whether the goat was a symbol of the Grecian Empire. And they had a number of symbols that depicted their nation. But the goat was one of them. Amongst, there was many, you know, the biggest one that came up was like this sun thing. I don't know what it was called. I didn't really care to look too much into it because I don't care to study their ideology. I was busy with studying the word of God. But the goat was amongst the many of the symbols that they used. And that's what they give us here in the scripture. And so we're rolling with that. <clears throat> and it says here that, let's see where, yeah, he, he went over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. That horn 
represents Alexander the Great. He is this the powerhouse. Now watch what happens. He came up to the ram that had two horns, which he had seen standing in front of the canal and rushed him in his mighty wrath. I saw him come beside the ram as he was enraged at him, and he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So we hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was no one to rescue the ram from his power. And that is exactly what he did. When he, again, when Alexander went in, he went in swift, quick. It was one of, it's like, you know, Bruce Lee. One of the more incredible things about Bruce Lee, I mean, the dude was powerful, but his speed was second to none. If you've never watched a video on him, like, go watch it. You'll truly be, I'm fascinated anyway. It'll blow you away how fast he was and how accurate he was with what he did. You know, he, one of the things that I heard he used to train with to give him accuracy and speed was he used to have people throw grains of rice at him and, his, and just throw them fast and hard. And his goal was to catch the grain of rice. And, I mean, you imagine that is not an easy feat. But if you, his point was if I can catch a grain of rice, I can catch a fist. And he gave him great speed, great accuracy, and amongst the many of other things that he did. But that's how Bruce Lee was. That's how, I mean, he, he wasn't known for a lot of fights. But I can imagine what it'd be like if somebody had to fight him. I mean, where would you be before the fight even starts? I mean, his, his kicks were so fast that they actually had to slow pictures down to get to frame to frame to actually see his leg moving. Incredible speed. That's how Alexander the Great was. Incredible speed. And he went in swiftly, did it, and was out. In and out. Before he had a time to react, it was over. It was just... Where am I here? Um, verse 8. It says, Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. Again, that's a characteristic of every nation in the world, even America. You know, we talk about being a godly nation, but the truth is we're as heathenistic as any nation I've ever seen. If not more, we are, we are the leading heathenistic nation, hedonistic and heathenistic nation of the world. You know, we went to, my wife and I went to Bulgaria a number of years back, and I would love to go back. I would love to, you know, at some point as this little fellowship grows, to, you know, put a team together to go with the Albuquerque team to Bulgaria, to Haiti, to those places. But I'll never forget when we're in Bulgaria. They are so enthralled with American culture. And they want to be so much like us. And they do things like when we're there, they're having a Pride Week. And I was like, I was shocked. I was like, a Pride Week co corresponding with ours. And I was just like, why? Why are you guys... I mean, this isn't you, guy. Why do you want to follow us? They were always bumping American music and American idioms and phrases and this and that. And I'm like, it was really sad to see. I'll be honest, it was sad to see. They were beautiful people, beautiful culture. And the influence of the West was just disgusting. It is why many of the Muslim nations or many of the Eastern nations look at us with disgust. Amen. Because America's not known as a godly nation abroad. We're known as a nation of hedonism of sex symbols, of when, the, when, when people think of Western Christians, they think, oh, adultery is okay. That's disgusting. It's not okay. And by any means is it okay. No, God says no. But that's how we're viewed abroad. And so when people hear we're, we're a nation of God and they see what's going on, the truth is America, we've magnified ourselves beyond God, which is why we've superseded his rules, his laws. And we somehow think that as a nation, we know better. And so we're going to do it our way. We're going to slaughter our babies just like they did in ancient Canaan. And we're going to worship the Asherah just like they did in ancient Canaan. And we're going to do all the same things just differently. We're going to do it less, you know, less like a bunch of barbaric people. And we're going to do it more modernized. We're not going to make a God and have sex before the God. We'll just do it in the bedroom. You know, they used to go to temples and so forth and do it. Well, we're not going to kill our babies in the stomach of a huge iron giant named Molech. We'll just do it in the belly of our moms. It's the same worship. It's the same garbage. It's just, it looks new. It's like, you know, when you get the, the new Mountain Dew or Dr. Pepper. New look, same great taste. You know? That's, that's what's going on in America. Nothing we're doing is new. Nothing, none, none of this is new. Even with the whole pride movement. Dude, they were doing that in Rome 2,000 years ago. Get out of here with that. It's not new. It's old. Same package, same stuff in the package. It just looks new. It's not. But America has come to a, pro, a place of great arrogance. And boy, America better humble itself and get on its knees because... It, whew, 
who are we to think that God won't judge us like he judged every other nation in history? He judged his own Israelites. And he doesn't love them more than he loves us, but I mean, Israel's a prominent figure when it comes to, to the word of God or when it comes to the heart of God. I mean, America's not called the apple of God's eye. Israel is, you know? And if he judged them, if he disbanded them from their, their, their land, if he, you know, allowed them to be attacked and destroyed several times, who do we think we are that he won't do it to us? I believe right now we're, we're coming to the peak of judgment in America. And as Christians, we need to take responsibility for that. Again, Second Corinthians, uh, Second uh, Chronicles seven fourteen says, "If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and repent," he's not asking the, the, the all the you know Gentiles to repent. He's not asking the unbelievers to. He's saying we need to repent. Well, but Lord, I don't do those things. No, but as a nation collectively, we do. I'm part of this nation. That's part of the problem. So I need to repent on behalf of what my nation is doing. And if Christians would just really do that, I wonder what would happen in this country. If we would stop, be so, stop being so darn divided and unite for the common cause of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the spreading of his word, and if we would come together and we would just be the light and the salt of the earth like we're told to be, I wonder what would happen to this nation. Here we see... Alexander the Great magnified himself, and he had good reason to. I mean, as a heathen, as a, as, as, as a total, you know, he does, he's not a God-fearing man. He's conquered the whole world. He's done it in a greater time than any other figure in history. Even to this day, nobody, Rome didn't even conquer that quick. Why shouldn't he be great? Why shouldn't he magnify himself? In his mind, he's not, has no God to be accountable to. Basically, in his mind, I'm sure he is God. But what did I say? When one magnifies themselves, that's typically the start of their downfall. Read the following verse. As soon as he was mighty, or where are we at? So he says, um, verse 8, Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly. But as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. That's the death of Alexander the Great. Great man as far as it came to brilliance, strategy, war. 12 years, the whole known world, 10 to, 10 to 12 years, the whole known world was conquered. And then he died. <laughs> now, whether it was of natural causes or poisoning, I mean, really, I truly don't care. It's not important. But the point is, in his magnificence, in his royalness, in his... Then he just, like that, dead. And what in its place came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven? <laughs> Man's arrogance is the mark of his downfall. And the saddest part is, you know, we think we are so great. And the truth is we're only here on borrowed time. The breath in your lungs is borrowed breath. It's, you know, that's all we are is under borrowed anything. And who are we that God should even save us? And he does. So if there's anybody watching or if there's anybody here that in their own hearts have magnified themselves, I would, I would encourage you, just decide at this point, say, hey, you know what, Lord, I'm not as great as I thought I was. I've told you guys before, there was a point in my life where I was like, Lord, what would you do without me? Really, God would probably do way better without me. Honestly, I've said this, and I really mean this. Me being on his team doesn't benefit him in any way. If I was not on God's team, he would probably be better off. It's the fact that he uses me in spite of me that shows how magnificent and glorious he is. Just straight up. Call it like it is. The truth is, I'm just glad God uses me at all. There is really nothing that great in me. I promise you, anybody who thinks that I'm something great, stop. Because boy, you're going to run into a brick wall. And you're going to be going like 50, 60 miles an hour and your face is going to go flat. We magnify the living God. Because just like that, I can die. Mark, who was it? Uh, Elsie was with me. I almost got hit while I was out here on my motorcycle. Some girl pulled out in front of me. And I mean, it was a really close call. Totally just mean and disrespectful for her to do that. It turned out she was on her phone, not paying attention, I guess. Or, but she saw me, but whatever. You know, I'm just a biker. That could have been the end of it. I'm 32. I'm almost as old as this dude. Just like that. We are not that great. It's God who's great. It's Him we magnify. But, you know, we're looking at this from a historical aspect. The horn is broken. That's, that's Alexander the Great dying. And interestingly, that these four conspicuous horns come up out of that one horn. 
Because when Alexander the Great died, he had no child to pass it. There was nowhere for it to go. And it ended up going to his four to four of his generals. That represents these four horns. It went to Seleucus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Lys uh, Lysimachus. Sorry, I messed that up, but I really don't care. <laughs> so the Seleucid Empire went eastern, all over the Babylonian region and so forth. Uh, Cassander took over the west, Ptolemy took the south, and Lysimachus took the north. Now the two prominent ones in history that we see are the Seleucids, and Ptolemy, and we see that those two end up being the ones that become the main players throughout the rest of the Grecian Empire. And we're going to see that it's out of the Seleucid Empire that this Antiochus IV comes out. And this man is a man of war. He's a great man as far as war and intelligence is posed. And we're going to see him do kind of like Alexander the Great did, just not nearly on the same scale as far as conquering goes. It says in verse 9, out of one of them came forth a rather small horn. Now, in the NASB, which is what I teach out of the New American Standard Bible, it says a small horn. And I believe they, they, they make that word small for a specific reason, so that there's not confusion. Because do you have a, a New King James? Mm -hmm. So hers is going to say, it's a little horn. And the reason I believe the NASB said small, little, same thing, is so that there's a differentiation to make sure we know this isn't the same horn talked about in chapter 7. Remember, we have the four beasts, and out of the fourth beast comes a little horn, a small horn, this little horn. So the whole purpose of that is so I believe that there's not confusion. This little horn here, the small horn, is not the Antichrist. Again, I, I'll, some people will take and run with that. It, it'll be confused. But we're going to see an interesting parallel between him and the Antichrist, and we'll get there in a moment. But this small horn... Where's yeah, see, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. It grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to earth, and it trampled them down. And I want to stop there, just real quickly. Um, what did I say? I just saw it in my notes. So one of the ways I want to make sure we understand that this little horn is different from the one in chapter seven is this. In chapter seven, it comes first. It comes out of the fourth beast, not the third beast. We know that the fourth beast is Rome, the third beast is Greece. We're still talking about the Grecian Empire. This whole chapter deals with, with uh, Medo-Persia and Greece. Secondly, the, this one comes after a fifth horn, because uh, we, we have Alexander the Great, the four generals, and then after them, he's the fifth horn that comes out, this little horn. In the fourth beast, he comes after ten horns, and coming up, plucking out three. So different people, we want to make sure we understand because we're going to see some things here that are going to make us want to say, oh, this is the Antichrist, this is the Antichrist. This guy is not the Antichrist. He's a foreshadowing of the Antichrist to a huge degree. And I believe personally of the same spirit. And again, we're going to see that in just a moment as we go forward. And generally across the board, theologians across the board, accept this not to be the Antichrist, but to be Alexander the Great. Any reputable theologian or most reputable theologians will take that stance because looking back historically, we saw this happen in the second century BC, what we're about to read. Now, if you were to read the non-canonical book of the Maccabees, they go into much greater detail on Antiochus Epiphanes and what he did. He was a cruel man. He was a very, very evil, cruel man. Um, if you've ever heard of Maccabees, I would encourage you to read it. It's not a bad book. You say, but it's not in the Bible. It doesn't make it any less history. You know, if I were to write down that Blake's has the best burritos within a mile distance and write that in a book and stick it somewhere, it doesn't make it the Bible, but it doesn't make it any less true either. It's historically, that's a pretty, I don't know, not everybody would agree, but anybody with real taste buds would agree because Blake's has good burritos. And so the book of Maccabees, think of it like that. It's not canonical, meaning it's not, we don't consider it scripture, but it doesn't make it any less historical. It doesn't make it any less factual as far as the facts of what's being recorded go. And so I, if you get a chance, I'd encourage you to read it. It'll give you a lot of information about what's taking place here. Again, second century BC, we saw this happen. Now, when we go forward, and it says here that uh, it grew up to the hosts of heaven, again, like every king magnifying himself. He grew up to the hosts of heaven and caused some of the hosts and some of the stars to fall to earth, and it trampled them down. Most commentators, when it comes to that verse, will agree and say that that represents the Levites and the priests. 
and they very well may be right, and they appear to be right. I take the stance that is correct. That when he's talking about this, he's talking about that. So let me back up just a little bit. So for the next couple hundred years, or as far as you know, the Greek empires up when when uh, they raised, we got those four generals. There's a lot of collusion, a lot of stuff that happens between these four generals. Like I said, so the Seleucids up in the north and the eastern north, whatever north from from uh, the Ptolemies, there's going to be a lot of beef between them. And there's going to be a lot of conquering back and forth. There's going to be a lot of stuff that takes place. And at some point, Rome gains power. And even though Rome is in power, these little empires are still, excuse me, they're still alive. They're still going. They still have their own kingdom and their kings and stuff. But we're going to fast forward to Antiochus IV. He goes down, down to Egypt. He's conquering everything in that whole region. He's just conquering everything. And he's just decimating everybody he comes with great power great strategy and he's basically doing like a mini alexander the great he makes his way on down to egypt and he's putting a whooping on them and rome steps in rome stepped in with his father as well his dad was a conqueror also and the, the rome came in and disbanded his dad and said hey you're going to cut it out or we're going to take you out so he's following his daddy's footsteps he's back down in egypt and he's conquering doesn't conquer alexandria but he conquers a lot of egypt and Rome steps on in and says, look, we dealt with your daddy and now we got to deal with you. Cut it out. Now. And he basically tells them, give me a couple days to think about it. <laughs> now, arrogance. Rome says, no. They get a stick and they draw a circle around him. And they say, before you step out of that circle, you better have decided. Well, Rome at this point is the powerhouse. Remember what Rome was? It was that giant beast with iron teeth and iron claws and hands and feet and crushing everything in its sight. Nothing stood against Rome at that point. I mean, it, so it was basically continue and we're going to take you out or go home. Get out of Egypt. And so he decides wisely, okay, I'm done. And he works his way on back up and he stops somewhere on his way back up home. He stops in Palestine, what we call Israel. And... Alexander IV was a Hellenist. He, he believed in Hellenizing the world. He believed in the Greek culture. He believed in wherever he went, we're going to make you Greek. You're going to speak Greek. You're going to think Greek. You're going to talk Greek. You're going to live Greek. You're going to worship Greek. Well, everything you do is going to be Greek, which there played a good part to that. I mean, the good part about the Greeks Hellenizing the world was, you know, the one language made the spreading of the gospel magnificently easier. And then when Rome came in and they really took over the world and they made roads and, I mean, that made the spreading of the God. All God is doing here is setting up, you know, pavement to, to go spread the gospel. But he stops in, in, in Israel. He comes to the temple. He starts knocking off priests, killing them, basically telling people, you're going to bow or we're going to kill you. Many of the Jews jump on board. They're cool with worshiping, you know, the Greek false gods and they're cool with, you know, disbanding themselves from, from the, the true and living God. And many aren't. And, you know, when you read the book of First Maccabees, you're going to read about those wars. And this is where Hanukkah comes in play and all that good stuff. But what Alexander the Great ultimately did, Alexander the Great, what Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, uh, what he eventually did was he took down God. He took, down, took out the utensils. He took out the, 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 the altar of incense. He took out the lampstand, the table of showbread. And he put the Greek versions of those in there. And he erected a statue of Zeus. And he worships a pig on the altar of Zeus, which... If you know anything about the Jewish history, that is about as blasphemous as you can get. Because a pig is considered dirty to the Jew. You don't deal with pigs. You don't eat pigs. Don't even touch a pig. So even in Jesus' parable, don't even cast your pearl before swine. Swine is considered disgusting. To offer a pig in the temple is beyond imaginable to a Jew. I mean, we're talking today about like, you know, when, when, when Catholics come out of Catholicism and into Christianity, it's like the unforgivable sin. That's how they would have felt, but even on a higher standard. Because this is the temple of the living God. And he does this for about six years, a little over six years, and we'll see that here in a moment. But I can't remember why I got into talking about that, but <laughs> I did. Anyway, so it's, it's, oh, oh, talking about the host of heaven and whatnot, and talking about how, how this... Uh, he exalted himself basically to the status of God, brought down the stars and so forth. And if we read a little bit further in verse 11, it says, It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the hosts, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. That's everything I just told you about. Now, interestingly enough, people think this is the Antichrist because the Antichrist is going to do the same 
the, we know the Antichrist is of the enemy, of Satan, like legitimately of Satan. And we know that the Antichrist took down a host of the heavens. We'll actually look at that in a moment here. Actually, we'll turn there now. If you turn in your Bible with me to Isaiah chapter 14. So if you go four books backwards, so if we're in a Daniel, you go backwards to Ezekiel, Lamentations, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and go to chapter 14. And we'll read verses 12, 13, and 14. And listen, this, this, this here is a picture of the enemy, of Satan himself. He says, But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will rise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the, to the recesses of the pit. That sounds just like him. He exalts himself. He brings down a host of the heavens. I believe that one's in, in, in Ezekiel. It talks about that in the book of Revelation, that, 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 that Satan himself does this. He's that dragon that we see in the mid-chapters of Revelation. And so people will look at this and they want to say, well, this is the Antichrist. But it's not. Remember, we're still speaking about the third kingdom. Now, I do believe that this is a very real representation of the Antichrist. There's a word for that. It's called a biblical foreshadow. What is a biblical foreshadow? It's like this. Did Jesus come? No? Maybe? Did Jesus come? Yeah, Jesus came. Is Jesus coming? Yeah. Of course he is. When we see prophecy, we often see it as just one, you know, one big blur. Until you get up close. Until you're going through and you realize there's multiple facets to a prophetic speaking example when the prophets prophesied of Christ oftentimes you see the first and second coming kind of matched in together and unless you know how to distinguish them it looks like just one coming and that's why the Jews when when they thought of the Messiah coming they didn't think of a suffering servant I mean they did because the Bible talked about him suffering and so forth but it also talked about him being reigning and ruling and conquering and and of course you're gonna go with that one above the suffering but we know these are messianic but where's this guy who's supposed to reign and rule He's still coming. I love how uh, I've heard pastors mention that if you've been in Albuquerque and you look at the San Diego, pretty much if you look at any mountain chain, you look at it from a distance and it looks just like, you know, like it is just one mountain there, like one big hill. And typically when you go up to the mountain, you find it's split. Oh, there's ravines and valleys. And what looks like one big picture turns out to be multiple mountains that, you know, from a distance look like one. That's the prophetic literature. And so when we're looking at this, you know, it's, it kind of meshes together and we see this guy and we see that the Antichrist is going to do everything he's doing, except this isn't him. He's nothing but a foreshadow of what's to come. That's important for us to understand that this isn't the Antichrist. This will literally take place in the second century BC. Well, how do we know that? That wasn't just the end of the fulfillment because Jesus in Matthew 24 says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, run speaking of the end when the antichrist raises up himself his image in the temple sacrifices in the temple demands worship of himself in the temple speaks blasphemies in the temple rises himself above the host of heaven in the temple future tense when jesus was alive and walking this is already 250 years old so obviously he's not looking back he's looking forward saying when you guys see this run so we know the same characters, I believe it's of the same spirit, that spirit of the Antichrist, the first John talks about that, different people, but it appears to be the same spirit that empowers Antiochus, that will empower the Antichrist, but on a much grander scale. It's important again for us just to click in there. Now when it says, let me back up because my pages be turning while I'm over here wailing around. When it says here, verse 11, it even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the hosts. Now, if you look in your Bible, it'll say, yours will say prince. If you have a New King James, for NASB, it'll say a commander. If you look, the, 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 the writers and the interpreters that, that translated this it puts a capital C or a capital P to signify God. Now, it's not necessarily talking about God. Again, that's, that's, that's the way the translator did it. But it is at the same time. Now, let me explain myself. What this commander of the host is talking, this is the high priest. 
That's who that would be. On, on a real scale of interpretation back in 200 BC, that would be the high priest. So the, why would it capitalize it then? Well, the high priest was put in place by none other than God. God himself. And so for Antiochus to raise himself above the high priest, because Antiochus is the one who makes the sacrifice, that, that was the job of the high priest to make that atonement between man and God. And Jesus became our high priest, making atonement between man and God. So he raised himself above the commander of the host, so to speak, by saying, God, my way is greater than yours. I'm going to bring down who you set up and I'm going to put myself there. That's legitimately what that's saying. So again, we want to make sure we make that distinction. It's him challenging us. It's his challenge to God. Now, there's a real application there for us. And that application is realize when God has put in play an authority, when God has put in power an authority, and we challenge that authority, realize who you're challenging. Now realize not every person that's, you know, not everything is set up from and by God. But when we know that an authority is set up by God, and you challenge that authority, let me give an example. Some people raise themselves up to be leaders and it wasn't God who raised them up. We've seen them. You guys have all met those pastors who you know aren't pastors and shouldn't be pastors and you know they're running amok. And you're like, dude, you're not a pastor because God has called you. You're a pastor because you want some glory. Let's be let's be real, man. Let's be real. You want the you want the spotlight. You're not willing to put in the work with it. You want to stop it. I've met many of those pastors. And you look at their ministries and it's like, oh, Mike and Michelle have dealt with them. They've told me many of the ministries that they've dealt with over the years. And it's like, well, those are just people who want to be pastors that aren't pastors. And it's okay to not be in a position of authority because honestly, it's hard. But when God raises it up, realize God put that person there. And to challenge that person, realize who you're challenging. Well, the high priest was set up by God personally. It was very specific who, who, would, who was to be a high priest. Very specific. Throughout generations, who would be who. And for Antiochus to challenge that was a direct challenge to God. When the Antichrist Christ comes, that foreshadowing, he will legitimately challenge God on an even higher scale. And he will, he will demand worship of himself. Antiochus' epiphany didn't quite go that far. He's like, worship Zeus. You know, let's Hellenize. The Antichrist will say, worship me. And we'll get there next week. We're actually going to delve into that portion. We're going to zoom on into the end. So here it's giving us a foreshadow of that. And next week we're going to dive right into the actual Antichrist coming with the whole yield. And we'll get there. I only got like 10 minutes, so I want to make sure I finish this up. Now it says here, verse 12, And on account of transgression, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice. That's what I just mentioned when it says that he... You know, took away the regular sacrifice and offered the pigs. He offered what was unclean. And it will fling truth to the ground and perform and will prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply, while the transgression causes horror? So to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled, he said to me for 2,300 evenings, 2,300 evenings and mornings, and the holy place will be properly restored. Now Daniel being a devout Jew, Daniel being one who sought the restoration of Israel, who sought the restoration of the temple. We saw a few weeks back that when he would pray, he'd pray to the east, he'd pray towards Jerusalem because that's what the Bible commanded. For him to be seeing this would have been like, <gasps> that would be like, imagine you seeing a vision of your kids, your grandkids, and your great-grandkids all, you know, joining in Baphomet worship and in orgies and going off on this disgusting stuff. Imagine if you saw that in, in a vision. You would like, <gasps> that's how Daniel feels. To see the temple of the holy and living God being desecrated. Like, this is going to happen in the future? Like, What? And them probably knowing this was on his heart, they make mention of this, that this will go on for 2,300 days, which is just over six years on the prophetic scale. So when we're looking at prophetic years or biblical years, the Jewish year is 360 days, and so it's, it's just over you know, six years, which again, interesting, because the Antichrist will have his little escapade for, uh, it's gonna be a seven-year treaty, but the, the, the treaty is seven years. I wonder if when he sets everything up, I wonder how close it'll be to this 2,300 days. Interesting. I'm just 
something I was thinking about while I was studying this, you know, I didn't really look into it because of time's sake. Like I said, we're almost out of time and I don't want to take any more rabbit trails. We will finish. Most of the meat is here in the front and then they're just going to read off a lot of the interpretation and you'll see how everything we've already said just kind of fits right into place as we go forward. But it was super interesting to think about that. Then we go to verse 15. Daniel kind of wakes up out of his vision. Let's see, it says, When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. Now, I think it was last week we talked about when Daniel was troubled because he didn't understand. And I'm going to reiterate it. I'm going to say it again. If you've ever been reading scripture and you read something, you're like, I just don't get it, Lord. I want to understand. Well, take great comfort in knowing that the prophets didn't understand a lot of what they saw either. And when the prophets gave what God gave them, their job wasn't to understand what they were giving. Their job was to simply relay the message. <laughs> you know? And that's what they did. So take comfort in we're not going to understand and know everything. And if there is something you're studying and you really just want to understand, I'm going to encourage you, don't just study, 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 study. I mean, you better study if you want to understand. But ask God, pray, seek, seek and you will find. It's almost like it should be a scripture or something. You know, it is, you know, but, you know, seek, ask God. You know, for those who like to study, I've heard this said and I live by it. All study and no prayer is, oh, I'm going to go back. All prayer and no study is laziness. So don't just pray about understanding the scripture. It's like study, get in the word. Ask God, look, read, read into history. Pray, pray, pray. Study, study, study. All prayer, no study is laziness. On the opposite end of the spectrum, all study and no prayer is atheism. If you're just studying, 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 realize that it's God who's the revealer. He's the one that gives revelation. So if you want something to be revealed to you, study and pray. Ask God, I want to understand what this means. He may show you in an instant and it may take months. There's some things that I've had to study for months and then all of a sudden it's like, boom, there it is. There it is. Well, we're in good company because Daniel didn't understand the vision either. And we're going to see at the end of the chapter, he still didn't understand the vision even after it was explained to him. So we're in good company when we don't understand. And it says, And behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of Uli. And he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. Now we see Gabriel appearing to Daniel. And this appears to be the first time he appears. And it's, it's the first of several times that he'll appear to Daniel. And oftentimes when we see a, an angel appear in scripture, we see that it's Gabriel. He's actually one of three angels that are named in all of scripture. That's it. There's three angels that are named. I know if you go to the Catholic uh, tradition or the Jewish tradition, they have like 52 angels that are named. But the truth is, Scripture only names three. We have Michael, we have Lucifer, and we have Gabriel. Those are the only ones named. Any other one is just conjecture. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Gabriel is one of those three. Many... Uh, believe he's a, an, an archangel maybe he is the bible only tells us that mike uh, michael's an archangel and it may say lucifer was an archangel um what does that mean it's just a rank of angels it appears i want to say it's in ezekiel that it talks about his rank but for sure michael is mentioned as an archangel gabriel maybe he is maybe he isn't many believe he is besides the point just something for you to jot down in your own mind when you're reading through scripture you know, you run into somebody talking about the Gabriel or the angel of uh, Zechariah or, you know, all these other angels that they'll mention and Uriel and maybe they are, maybe they aren't. The truth is the Bible only mentions the three by name. We know there's myriads upon myriads of angels. We know that there's more angels than we can count for sure. But these are the only three that are mentioned. Um, no real significance there, but just something for you to know. He says in verse 17, So he came near to where I was standing, and while he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. Now, what did we talk about? Whenever angels appear, what happens? Terror falls upon the person that's before the angel. You, we, we constantly see that when an angel physically appears. And so I mentioned that because we talked about whether Daniel was physically in Susa or spiritually in Susa. Well, it says, when I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. It appears he's out of the vision now and he wants to understand. He sees this man standing by the bank, one who was before him, and it came to him. Now, if you're in a vision, 
you're not going to fall asleep because you're, you're in a vision. You know? It's like when you're dreaming, you don't dream about sleeping usually. And even if you're dreaming about sleeping, you're still awake in your dream. Does that make sense? Like, well, it says he sinks down. On your calendar, salad, <laughs> Trish is a... Uh, you know, Alexa disrupts us a lot. <laughs> she always did. It's not a big deal. It's okay. I know, she'll do it twice. Alexa, be quiet. All right, uh, hopefully that'll be it. <laughs> it's okay. She, like, she likes to join in. She wants to just be a part of the fellowship. <laughs> um, so anyways, what was I saying? Um, when we see angels appear, terror and fright fall upon them. And says, so it says when he came near, that, that he became frightened. So he came near to where I was standing, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. He's saying, Daniel, God is showing you what's going to take place throughout history. And ultimately, he says it pertains to the time of the end. Now, when I read that, that was an interesting thought because the Greeks don't pertain to the time of the end. The Romans pertain to the time of the end. Remember, it's the revived Roman Empire that precedes the Antichrist's coming, that precedes the end. And so in my mind, when I read that, I said, well, why does it say that it deals with the time of the end? And I believe it's that foreshadowing aspect that he's mentioning here. Because next week we're going to go in and we're going to see the fulfillment of the end of that. So we have the fulfillment of the first aspect in the 200s BC with Antiochus. And then we're going to see next week, as they go into more detail into this, that we're going to see the end with the Antichrist at the end of the age of the the end of the age of the Gentiles, so to speak. But when we look at verse 18, it says, Now while I was talking, while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. Again, that's not characteristic of somebody in a vision. That is characteristic of somebody when they, you know, when an angel actually shows up. Now, Isaiah in his vision, he falls to the ground and covers his face. He's like, oh my goodness, Lord. But he's fully awake and aware. Just terrors upon him in the presence of God. So keep in mind, when an angel shows up, you're in the presence of God, like his physical presence. It's not this, oh, it's all joyous, and I was in the presence of angels. No, it's like, holy, 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 <gasps> bow down. Not to worship the angel, it's just, I don't know why they bow. I'm, I've never seen an angel, so I can't tell you. So no when somebody comes and they're trying to tell you about, they saw angels and this and church. I've had people tell me, I was in church and an angel appeared over me, and I was all, oh. and I'm like, shut up. You know, you're, you're just a liar, stop it. You were probably on peyote or something, you know, don't, you know, <laughs> like, you know, because if you really saw an angel, that's not the reaction the Bible gives us of how one reacts to such a holy figure, figure, sorry, why? I always say figure, figure, <laughs> she corrects me on that one, um, the, the reaction is you fall to your face in terror, in dread, I went back just to reconfirm looking at the, 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 the gospels when the angels are at the tomb, and the, when they see him, it says, <gasps> If they freaked out and got afraid, every time angels appear, just terror precedes it when they physically appear. Proceeds it, not precedes, proceeds. But there we go. But he said it pertains to the appointed time of the end. Verse 20, we already read this one. The ram which you saw was the two horns, represent, with the two horns, represents the kings of Media and Persia. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn that is between his eyes, the first king, the broken horn and the four horns that arose... The, bro the, yeah, the broken horn and the four horns that arose in its place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. Again, you know, looking back from history, we see that there's nobody else. That, that is the kingdom of Greece, as it says it. That is Alexander the Great, because we saw it. That is the four generals that arose from his kingdom, because we've seen it. And then he goes on here to talk about this little horn. In the latter period of their rule, which is... You know, quite a ways down when Antiochus Epiphanes comes out. You know, in the latter period of their rule, when the transgression transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power, and he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. Now, of course, ultimately God allows it. So it's ultimately God that gives him the ability to. But I believe part of that power and intrigue and excellence and whatever we saw in here, I believe that's of the spirit of the Antichrist. Personal thing. You don't have to take it. That's just a personal thing. Him being the foreshadow of the Antichrist, I believe it is that very same spirit that empowered him to go about what, what takes place. Because what's the enemy, I mean, saying? What's his ultimate objective and goal? 
Or at one point, it was to stop the Messiah. Because it was the Messiah who was going to crush his head as his head bruised his heel. Failed. Then what's his point from there on out? To hinder the people of God, Jew and, Gent and, Jew and a Christian alike. Now, I know we all talk about, oh, the devil's at work, and the devil, and the devil, the devil. You know, the devil is one angel. So that's all he is. He's not even that great. I mean, God flick him out, he'll fly out. We see in Revelation, when God goes, he goes, falls from a star like, falls, falls like a star out of the heavens. And it's really Michael who throws him, so God sends Michael to take care of his light work. Michael, get him. He's not that powerful. And I know we all think we are so important, but I promise you the devil's not watching your life. He's got bigger fish to fry. You know? And I know we think America is so important. He's got bigger fish to fry. I'm convinced Satan is rooted in the Middle East. So convinced that nation's primary target is Israel. Israel is the key player in everything. Israel is centric to, the re to all of human history as far back as it goes. Israel is the center. America is not centered to anything. As a matter of fact, we're not even mentioned in the book of Revelation. We're not even denoted in there. There's not even an, an allusion to us in there. Which leads me in looking at the way our nation is going. It's not hard to understand. We're either so insignificant, we're not worth mentioning, or we just don't exist. Call it what it is. But Israel is the center of it all. Israel, that's where it's going to take place. Now, I believe there are demons and spiritual, because Ephesians tells us that we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, the powers of the air, the dark age. And, you know, yes, there are definitely spirits that, 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 that we get attacked by and so forth, but realize that it's not the devil. I promise none, none, of, none of us are that big. The devil can be in one place at a time. He's not om, uh, omnipresent like God is. So he's not God's counterpart by any means. He's like Gabriel's counterpart or Michael's counterpart. God is way above all of them. Really, if God snapped his fingers, he can just, Satan would disappear. It's not, it's not even a fight. So he, he's not counterpart to God. He's more counterpart to Michael or Gabriel or one of the other angels in existence. And so realize that the devil, he's really not that interested in you. He's got bigger fish to fry. Now, his little minions, I wholeheartedly believe they're messing with us on the daily. I believe they're part of the principalities that we face on the daily. But the devil's got bigger fish to fry. But I believe that same spirit that, fill, that, that will fill the Antichrist is this very same spirit here. And notice where both of them end up. They end up on the Temple Mount and the Temple. <laughs> I believe Satan's primary goal is to wipe out the Jews. See, the, and I'm going to tell you why, because the Jew is so important to the rest of the future, of, the future of, of existence, because there are things that God has promised the Jew that haven't come to pass yet. If there is no temple, where does Christ come back to? If there is no Jew, who receives the millennial kingdom? Because, I mean, the Jews are going to get a big part of that. I mean, the Jews' land, they've never occupied more than 10% of what God promised them and promise that they would occupy. We believe that will take place in the millennial kingdom. Well, if there is no Jewish race, nation, ethnic group, or land, well, then there's nothing to occupy. I'm convinced that's why, you know, the world wants to wipe the Jew off the map. Even in America today, you see anti-Semitism at like this ridiculous peak. We haven't heard much of it lately because of the recent riots. But in the past years, I mean, on campuses, they've been talking about banning the Jew. Palestinians and they deserve the land of Israel. I mean, Israel is a little tiny sliver the size of New Jersey that sits off the coast of the Mediterranean. And you look at the rest of the Islamic nation, it's hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of square miles. I mean, Israel looks like, if Israel was like that, that little uh, the, the rest of this page would be the Islamic empire. You know? and, and they want, the, they want the, the though. That's too much land for the Jew. We want that. And they want to wipe them dead because they don't really care about the land. They want to wipe the blood of the Jew off the face of the earth. And that's nothing more than Satan inspired. Same as here. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people. Oh, sorry, I went ahead of myself. Um, verse 24. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. Again, the foreshadowing, we know the Antichrist ravages the Jew and the Christian in that time. 
25, and through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence, and he will magnify himself in his heart, and will destroy many while they are at ease. And Antiochus did this as well. Like I said, many of the Jews got on board with him, and they were happy to worship Zeus. They were happy to join into the Hellenistic movement, into the Hellenistic prosperity, and so forth. And then many of the Jews were not cool with it. And we saw that exact thing happen. And he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. The vision of the evening and mornings, which has been told, is true. But keep this vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. Excuse me. Now, again, I want to make sure we understand this chapter deals particularly with who? Antiochus the Fourth, Antiochus Epiphanes. A foreshadowing of who? The Antichrist. And next week we're going to see as the Antichrist comes on the scene. And next week is an interesting one. Daniel 9 is, is probably a pivotal chapter for me. It's one of the ones that regrounds me every time I have doubts. Because when we read Daniel 9 or when we study Daniel 9, we're going to see that God gave the exact day to the Israelites that Jesus would come on the donkey presenting himself as Mashiach. Messiah. Daniel 9 is one of the most important scriptures of all the Bible because if Jesus didn't come at the appointed exact time that Daniel mentioned, then we have to scratch the whole Bible as a lie. Because if God got that wrong, even by a day, well then he's not omniscient. And then he's not really God. One of the most important chapters that we will ever study is next week. Um... Definitely be here. Let's finish it up. It says in verse 27, Then I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up and again, again, and carried on the king's business. But I was astounded at the vision, and there was no one to explain it. So what Daniel saw, I mean, it made him sick to his stomach. And sometimes as you're studying scripture, I'll be honest, like God will hit you in such a way that it's like, almost like a burden was put on you. There's nothing wrong with that. And that is okay. <laughs> it happened to the prophets? Don't be freaked out if it happens to you. Now, I like how he mentions here he carried on with the king's business. That right there shows me that he was probably down in Susa on the you know on business for the king. He was down in Susa physically. He has this vision, this incredible vision of of, of the history to come. And he got to foresee the entire Medo Persian Empire. Because remember, this is the third year of Belshazzar. Babylonia has not been conquered yet. And in his mind, it's how could these things be? The Persians are going to conquer us. We're the greatest nation in the world. Or Babylon is that he wasn't a Babylonian. And then the Persians are going to be conquered by Greeks. I mean, at this point, I don't even know how prominent Greece was on the world map, on the world scale. It probably wasn't very big. That would be like saying one day, you know, Bernalillo is going to conquer all of New Mexico. You know, we'd be like, Bernalillo, we'll squash him with our thumb. Are you kidding me? A tiny little town. But that's the, how he probably would have seen this. He's perplexed. He's shocked. He can't believe. What? What? And he says there was no one to... He was astounded at the vision, and there was no one to explain it. Now, I don't know. You know when I read that, I was like, the angel told him to keep it quiet. Now, I don't know the full details of what keep it quiet meant for Daniel. I didn't look into it. But it appears he talked to somebody about it, and probably his close friends, and nobody could explain it. Nobody could figure out what was going on. And so Daniel is completely perplexed. But God gave vision to Daniel. Realize sometimes God will give you vision, and your job isn't to understand the entirety of the vision. I'll never forget when God called me to be a teacher, to be a pastor, and I was just like, nah, I don't know about that. And then I finally said, okay, I'll do it. And then I fell flat on my face, and I'm like, I thought you called me to do this, Lord. So I tried it again, and then I fell flat on my face. I'm like, Lord, I thought I, and then I tried it again, and I fell flat on my face, and then I just quit. You know, and I studied the life of David, and I was looking at David and his life, and God anointed him at 14 years old, approximately, to be the king of Israel. Issue, Saul was still king. You can't have two kings, which is it? And then throughout David's life, his friends, kill Saul and take the throne. And what's his response always? I will not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. I will not, that, that is the Lord's anointed, no. And he just doesn't. And he allows God to take Saul out, and it's God who puts him on the throne. 
some 16 years later, you know, 15, 16 years later. But God showed him and God anointed him at 14. And I'll never forget, God anointed and called me, I mean, quite a few years back. And it wasn't for years later that God raised me up to finally come into what he called me to do. I believe oftentimes God will give us a vision, God will show us something for the future, maybe for your life. And, it, and, and our job isn't to jump into it and start scrambling and make it happen. It's God give you a little snippet of what he's got for you. Don't make yourself sick trying to figure it out. Just rest in him and let him bring it to, let him bring it to a fruition. Here Daniel is, got this great vision. He's trying to figure it out. Calm down, Daniel. God said it. It's sure. It's true. It'll happen. And Daniel's there when it happens. I believe it's why when Belshazzar calls Daniel into the feast, what does this mean? He's like, oh, I saw the vision. Now, remember, this is in his third year. Well, when, when that vision came, it was at the end of the empire. I saw the vision that God gave me of the goat, of the ram. You're going down, bro. You're going down tonight. All you have to do is relax. He'll, he'll know it when he sees it for you, an application, you guys. God may have shown you things of things to come in your life. I don't know what that might be. Maybe it's a position. Maybe it's a gift. Maybe it's a just rest and relax in God, and I promise. He's good. If, if it's from him, he will bring it to fruition. When we look at this, when we think about the story that we talked about, the angry atheist marksman who was the baddest shot in the world and compared to God was nothing. God knows. That's what we talked about last week. God knows. We can rest in what God knows because we can rest in what God has already fulfilled. We look at this and we see all of it, all of it just coming exactly as God said. Nothing is out of place historically. Everything we read happened to a T. And as we go further, we're going to get, we're going to zoom that lens in more and we're going to see to an even grander scale. Like, whoa, he goes in more detail. And we can be assured that what God says will take place will take place because what he said would take place did take place. That is, should be one of the greatest comforts in the world. So as we see our nation in an uproar and the world crying in chaos and all this going on, did Jesus not say that these things would happen? Did he not say that? That ethnicity would rise against ethnicity, nation would rise against nation. The Greek word is ethnos. That, that nationality would rise against now. He said it would happen. I'm not freaking out. I'm like, oh man, look, Jesus said. There it is. More proof that he's God. More proof that what he says is true. So let's not freak out. Let's bask in the Lord. Let's be about his business until he comes to take us. Father, we thank you for being who you are. We thank you for your word. We thank you for being true, Lord. There's nothing that you say that isn't true. There's nothing that you do, Lord, that isn't perfect. We thank you that you've loved us, that you have given us yourself, that we would know you, that we would be born again, Lord. We thank you that you've never left us, you've never forsaken us. We thank you, Lord, that we can come into your presence and just bask in you and who you are, Lord. I pray that as we continue to teach your word that your children would continue to grow in knowledge and wisdom and heart and strength, Lord encouraged to be about your business. We pray for Santa Fe that you'd shake the foundations of the city, Lord, that those who are hungry for your word would, 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 would come to you, Lord, would find you, and would grow. Just thank you for all the people that are here this morning. Would you bless them, and would you give them a good day, Lord? In Jesus' name we pray.